Hello marine biology students. In this video we're going to talk about where rivers meet the ocean. We're going to talk about estuaries. An estuary is a semi-enclosed area where freshwater and seawater meet and mix. Estuaries can experience wide changes in salinity, temperature, and exposure to air. In estuaries, there will normally be soft sediments, and typically there will be low species diversity, meaning the, the number of different types of species especially in adults or permanent residents of estuaries, but typically high biomass. The total mass of living organisms, and this includes the meofauna in addition to actually many plants that are right on the border, the salt marshes of the interface between the water and the land. There are several different types of estuaries, but again, they normally involve freshwater and saltwater mixing in a sheltered environment. One type of estuary, in fact the most common, are called drowned river valleys, or also called rias. They're the most common type of estuary, and they are formed by a rising of the sea level after the last ice age around a lowland for a river or the mouth of a river. So they are formed by the drowning of lowland around the mouths of rivers when sea levels rose after the last ice age. The Chesapeake Bay is an example of this. Here we can also see a drowned river valley estuary from Australia in the picture. Another type of estuary are bar-built estuaries. In this case, it's a sandbar or a bar of sediments that end up sheltering or enclosing an area where rivers are entering or meeting the sea. These are built up by the accumulation of sediments. into sandbars or barrier islands. And so the coast protected by Cape Hatteras barrier islands are an example of a bar-built estuary. There are also tectonic estuaries, where land bordering the oceans begins to subside due to the movements of the Earth's crust. San Francisco Bay is an example of a tectonic estuary. And the last category of estuaries are fjords. These are deep valleys cut on the coast as a result of retreating glaciers. These can be found in Alaska, Norway, New Zealand, and Chile. The best and most developed estuaries are going to be in areas where the coastal plain is flat and the continental shelf is wide. These are the passive margins. Whereas active margins usually have a very narrow continental shelf and they have a more abrupt transition from land to sea. And so on an active margin, you aren't going to have an abundance of estuaries. A defining feature of estuaries is fresh water and salt water coming in contact with each other. Now the density of fresh water is significantly less than salt water, and so the seawater is going to form what's called a salt wedge as tide comes in or as the interface of these two water sources mix. Another way of thinking about this is that the fresh water will attempt to form a thin surface layer. Salinity in an estuary varies from 5 to 30 parts per thousand. It varies according to 
the distance from the seawater, or the tidal input, and the quantity of the freshwater, or the river input. The depth also contributes to the salinity profile. Again, because saltier water is more dense, it will be found at deeper levels. A defining characteristic of estuaries is that the salinity just is not uniform. The salt water is heavier and sinks below the fresh water. As water is brought in by the tides, a salt wedge is formed. Organisms in estuaries are normally urihaline. in that they tolerate a wide range of salinities. Some are osmoregulators. And have mechanisms for keeping their internal solute concentrations stable. Others are osmoconformers. and have internal concentrations that vary with their surroundings. In this diagram, we see the typical salinity tolerances of organisms, whether they are stenohaline marine organisms, urihaline marine organisms, brackish water species, or freshwater species. This chart shows us the difference between osmoregulators and osmoconformers, with an osmoregulator typically having a flat line whereas osmoconformers would have a line at a set slope. We see these crabs are able to somewhat regulate their internal concentration, at least for certain ranges of salinity. Estuaries aren't just about the organisms living in the water, but also those living adjacent to the water. There are many flowering plants in estuaries, and they often contribute a large amount to the productivity of these environments. Now, some of these have special mechanisms to deal with the salty water that they're around. They can expel excess solutes, such as the salt glands in the cordgrass spartina, and also many mangroves. The photo we see here is of a mangrove which secretes a solute-rich solution onto its leaves. And as the water evaporates away, you can see the salt crystals left behind. Some of these flowering plants actually concentrate the solutes in certain glands, such as the pickleweed, salicornia. The substrate in estuaries is almost always soft sediment. It's usually going to be mud or sand. And they often, because they are sheltered, have low wave activity, which is why this sediment hasn't been washed away or taken as sediment down to the sea floor. So normally they will be continental sediments. Mud is difficult for many animals to move through. The mud and sand also shift and are unstable. making it a difficult environment for organisms that need a hard substrate to grow on. Particle sizes of the sediments are also usually small enough that most of the sediment areas are actually anoxic. As denoted by that dark black color to the soil where anaerobic bacteria are breaking down organic matter in the absence of oxygen. That black sediment would likely smell very strongly of sulfur and be quite unpleasant. Temperature is another factor that varies in estuaries. As with tide pools, there can be wide variation in temperature, especially at low tide. This can be stressful on marine organisms when the difference in temperatures are the greatest especially in summer. These physical challenges can be limiting to the diversity of species which can survive there permanently. A very important role of estuaries 
is actually that of a larval development ground. They are the nurseries for many marine species. When we look at contributions from the open water into an estuary, the dominant organisms include plankton, both in the form of phytoplankton and zooplankton, and also fishes. It turns out that many marine species spend at least a portion of their lives in estuaries, mostly as larvae. This also speaks to estuaries' almost hidden importance to the survival of other marine communities as well. Another difficulty of estuaries has to do with water transparency. They are usually so full of sediments from terrestrial regions that the ability of light to penetrate the waters is greatly reduced. So normally, water transparency is very poor. Due to suspended sediments and particles from rivers in the water. This reduced clarity makes it more difficult for photosynthesis in autotrophs in the water. Most of the primary production of estuaries is the result of flowering plants on land. As opposed to seaweeds or phytoplankton, this reduced visibility also can make it difficult for certain visual predatory fish to find their prey. However, sharks have been known to swim in estuaries and up rivers seeking prey and their ability to detect electrical impulses using their ampullae of Lorenzini allow them to find prey even when the water is murky. Salt marshes are a common type of estuary with cord grass making up a dominant species in these salt marshes. They have high primary productivity and serve as a nursery for the young of many species. These salt marshes often contribute detritus both to the estuary and also to some of the neighboring intertidal regions outside of the estuary as well. Most estuaries will have a soft bottom and so many burrowing organisms, even though the sediments themselves are anoxic, they will have mechanisms to connect them to the oxygenated water above, either long siphons or mechanisms for making burrows and actively pumping water through those burrows to maintain an oxygenated living area. The fat innkeeper worm, which is an echiurin, a type of annelid, has a burrow that will often be shared with many other species. And so their name of being a fat innkeeper worm is because so many other species are dependent on their burrow in addition to themselves. When we look at food webs within estuaries, we see a lot of the primary productivity is going to come from the salt marshes, and that contributes to a detritus pool. There will be phytoplankton and some benthic diatoms and seaweeds, and those can be preyed on directly by herbivores, but we see that filter feeders and deposit feeders are more common in the estuary environment, and the carnivores are going to come in the form of fish and birds. As I had mentioned, sharks have been known to frequent river mouths and also estuary environments where they can use their special abilities to detect prey, even if the water is not clear. And this completes our introduction to estuaries. Now, before our next video, I want you to think about what is your preferred way to use coastline? We'll talk about that in the next video.